Father and God, we pray that you would allow your word, cause your word to be alive, powerful, to lift up your name and to feed your people this day. In Christ's name, amen. Among the annoying and sometimes costly parts of modern life is identity theft. It's an increasing problem. Several times in just the past few months, a personal or church credit card has been compromised and misused. The banks involved thankfully acted very quickly and protected from harm. But this underlines how easily our personal information can be accessed. People can know virtually anything about us. A little over a year ago, before moving here, when we were ready to put our house in Georgia on the market, did a Google search to get some idea of comps and what needed to ask for a house. And just entering in a very simple search, I unintentionally came across a database that showed the, the names of all my neighbors, when they bought their house, and, and how much they paid for it. Uh, that's how much is out there. Companies selling online protection warn us that anything and everything that we put online is potentially available to anyone forever. It's out there, and you can't pull it back in. And this creates feelings of vulnerability, anxiety over unwanted exposure. In the complexity of our humanity, on one hand, we crave to be known. But on the other hand, we want privacy. Now, different ones of us want more or less of, of one or the other of those two things. Some will deny completely needing one or the other. But part of our basic humanity is both a need to be known safely by some people and also at the same time a need to protect our most intimate thoughts and feelings. There's a reason why God did not create us with the ability to read minds. But what about God? Does God really know what we think and feel? Our psalm this morning answers that question and others clearly and decisively. Look with me in Psalm 139, beginning with the first six verses of the 139th Psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. God knows more about you than the IRS. He knows more about you than equal facts. He knows more about you than your mama. And your mama knows more than you think. <laughs> David said that the Lord had searched him and known him. Now Spurgeon points out correctly, this is a figure of speech. God does not have to stop and do a search to find out what's going on in your life or my life. The Almighty does not use Google to check on us. He knows everything. The point of this verse in this phrase is he is focused on us. God actually pays attention to you. He pays attention to his beloved children in Christ. You and I are in the heart of God. In one place, Scripture says our name is written in the palm of his hand. And he knows us as thoroughly as though he has done a comprehensive search on us, far beyond what Google could show. God knows when we sit down and when we stand up. That's minute detail. He knows what you're going to say before you even say it. You ever have a moment where something just pops out and you didn't know you were going to say that? It may have surprised you, but it didn't surprise God. He knew it before the words formed on your lips. He knows every thought in your brain, every feeling in your soul. Spurgeon beautifully writes on this, Though thou shouldest give but a glance at my heart, and see me as one sees a passing meteor moving afar, yet thou wouldst by that glimpse sum up all the meanings of my soul. So, excuse me, so transparent is everything to thy piercing glance. 
Then focusing in on that third verse, you search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Listen to several different translations on that last part of that verse. The NIV says, you are familiar with all my ways. The New American Standard, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Another translation, you know every detail of my conduct. The Christian Standard Bible translates the entire verse, you observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Are you getting what the Holy Spirit is teaching us here? God knows every single thing about you. Everything. You're never out of God's sight. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God in the garden after their sin, and God played along. He called them by name as, as though he didn't know what was going on. But he knew where they were. He knew what they had done. He knew the shame that they were feeling that made them hide. God knows every sin in your heart, every word spoken, every action taken. He knows that dark secret you hide from everyone else. Many, if not most, or all of us have some things we try to forget that we ever did. When something happens that reminds us of it, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, let's put that back in the box. God knows that. Maybe your spouse doesn't. Maybe your boss doesn't. God knows it. But the main reason for this teaching about God knowing everything isn't watch out or God will get you. I know it's starting to sound that way, but that's not it. Verse 5 puts us in an entirely different light when properly understood. Look at that fifth verse again. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand on me. One translation takes the first part of this verse. You fence me in behind and in front. It's protective. And another translation renders the last part of that verse. You place your hand of blessing on my head. That's the idea. It's not God lays his hand on us to whomp us one. We couldn't handle that. He lays his hand a blessing on us. He knows what's going on, not to judge us, though he will if we don't repent, but he mainly is knowing us in Christ to protect us, to keep us, to bless us. Now, let's be clear. The Lord does know our sin. He's concerned about it, and he deals with our sin. But what it's saying here primarily is more that he's watching us to protect us, to bless us. Spurgeon says again, Shall we not say that our Heavenly Father has folded his arms around us and caressed us with his hand? It is even so with those who by faith are the children of the Most High. When we are in public places, especially if there's a crowd, I keep a close eye on our grandchildren and, and, uh, and on our surroundings. And if there's any potential danger, my eyes are bouncing from that child to that potential danger um, with intent to do whatever necessary to give protection. That's how God watches us. Not like a judge seeing when he needs to slap us down, but like a loving father or a loving grandfather wanting to make sure that we're staying safe. It's loving. It's protective. Now Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8, says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol was the Hebrew word for grave or place of the dead. Sometimes translated hell, but that's an unfortunate translation. It's much broader than that. But the idea of these verses, excuse me, is we, you can't get away from God. Now, why would we even try to flee from his presence? But if we foolishly try, it can't be done. Fly to the highest place, fly to outer space, fly to heaven itself, he's there. Make your bed in the grave and God's waiting for you there. You don't have to call his presence, he's already there. And what beautiful poetry in verses 9 and 10. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. The idea of all this is God is everywhere. He knows all things. He's omniscient. He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. No matter where you go, you can't run from God. 
You can't get away from God. Jonah tried it, and it didn't work. Many have tried it, and it just doesn't work. We can think we put ourselves in a place where God doesn't see us. He's not paying attention. But it's only our minds that's put him out of sight. But he's there, and he knows what's happening. You can run, but you can't hide. Verses 11 and 12, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Turn off the light in a closed room with no window. When you were younger, did you ever go in a coal bin, maybe in your house? One house we lived in had a coal bin. And when you went in there, if you closed the door, it was pitch dark. Couldn't see a thing. Even in a room like that, God sees what's going on. Go to the deepest, darkest cave with no lights. And guess what? God's already there. And he sees right through the darkness. In Jeremiah 23 and verse 24, the Lord says, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? God fills the heaven and the earth. God's presence is every place in the universe. Everywhere that exists, God is there. But let's not miss verse 10. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Again, God's omnipresence isn't a, I've got you, to the one that knows him in Christ. It's protective. It's a blessing. Even there the hand of God shall lead us wherever we go. And his right hand shall hold us. Hold us, caressing us, loving us. Again, protecting us. This is Abba Father that we're talking about. A loving God who will lead us and hold us in his right hand tenderly if we are believing in Jesus Christ. I want to be held in the hand of Abba Father. Don't you? I, I want him leading me. I want him to protect me from my own foolishness, my weakness, my stubbornness. Reading on in verses 13, 14, and 15. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. God knows us so well because he's the one who created us. He's the one who fashioned us and formed us. Look at the first part of verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And the word for unformed substance there can also be translated to embryo. No human being is an accident. God forms every one of us in our mother's womb. Now, what about birth defects and miscarriages? They happen. And the ultimate answer to that is way above my pay grade. But what I can say with confidence is God has a purpose even in those painful situations. I don't know what the purpose is. Uh, it's probably different in each situation. But he has a purpose. And even there, there's a manifestation of his love and grace if we look for it. Verse 13 again says, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Verse 15 tells how we're intricately woven. In verse 16a again, the eyes of God are on the unborn. Now, one thing we can draw from this and need to is we need to continually stand firm against the taking of the life of unborn children. Verse 14 shows us every human life is fearfully and wonderfully made. Not some of it, not the ones that turn out looking beautiful. All human life is fearfully and wonderfully made. Every human life from conception to death has a unique value because we're formed by God in his own image and likeness. Our worth is not determined by what we're able to do. Our worth is inherent. It's given to us by the act of creation and conception by God Almighty. All human life is uniquely made in the image and likeness of God. And the true Christian church is going to be pro-life in the deepest and most profound sense. 
wisely, compassionately, and with love. And we recognize the preciousness of all human life. I believe strongly and try to practice that the church needs to be extremely careful about political involvements. But abortion is a moral issue first and a political and legal issue second. The church, I'm convinced from scripture, can approve of abortion in only very limited situations. And there's some wiggle room and disagreement on exactly what those situations are, but they need to be few, they, they need to be limited, and we need to hold that conviction firmly, strongly, but compassionately. Women who have had abortions need to be treated with kindness, respect, and love. They are not the enemy. They are human beings that need to come to Christ. Some have already come to Christ. And as Christians, they made a horrible mistake. And most of them know it. They don't need to be hammered. They need to be loved. Abortion for illegitimate reasons, and again, most are illegitimate, is sin. It's a great sin. I will not minimize it. But it's not an unforgivable sin. A man who pressures a, wo pressures a woman to have an abortion shares in that sin. The politician who votes for laws that allow abortion on demand is sinning and needs to be held accountable. But in all of this, we need to stand for truth firmly, yet with grace, compassion, and love. Marching for life is something good that we should do if we're able. Praying at an abortion clinic is good that you should do if you're called to do it. But hatefully screaming at women entering a clinic is not helpful and it's not godly. Judgmentally condemning people is not helpful. Pray for an end to abortion on demand. Pray that women who have had abortions will find repentance and healing. Some of you may be called to offer ministries of healing to, to, to women in, in that situation. They very often carry inner scars and pain that no one can see. That there's few safe places that they can even talk about. They need compassion, not judgment. Verse 16, in its totality, says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Verse 16 is a very difficult verse to translate in the Hebrew. And the King James and the Coverdale, Coverdale translation we use this morning go, go in one direction. The vast majority of translations go like, like the ESV and the little bit I know about Hebrew is I looked at it, I think the ESV really nails it. This psalm has shown us a God who's omniscient and knows everything. It's shown us a God who's omnipresent. He's everywhere and you can't get away from him. Now, verse 16 subtly reveals the same God is omnipotent, meaning he has all power. Nothing is beyond his control. You see, not only does God know the number of our days, but he's formed those days. Again, listen to this. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That's pretty heavy truth. Even when we were just on form substance, an embryo in our mother's womb, God knew and had shaped every day that we are going to live. Not just the ones up until now, but every day we are ever going to live, God knew and he was shaping them. Listen to the way the New Living Translation translates this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Wow. Before we were born, every day of our life was laid out. Another translation, your eyes could see my embryo. In your book, all my days were inscribed. Every one that was fixed is there. The New American Standard, thine eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in thy book they are all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there is not one of them. God had every day of our life written out when we were just an embryo in our mother's womb. 
This verse doesn't say it, but from other verses, I think he had them laid out from eternity past, before the world was even created. Nothing in your life has ever surprised God. Not your sin, not those foolish words that slipped out that you didn't mean to say out loud, not the tragedy that happened to you that you didn't see coming. Nothing has surprised God. He knew it all from the beginning. And he will work ultimate good through everything he allows in the life of the one who trusts in Jesus Christ. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things. They're not good in and of themselves. That tragedy, that miscarriage, that death, that accident, by itself is evil. But it's like an intentional miscord, excuse me, discord in a beautiful symphony. It's there for a purpose. And in the total piece, it does make sense when you see the totality. You take that chord by itself, that discord, and it's horrible. You would wonder, what are those mu musicians doing? Why didn't the conductor train them better than that? You take those individual tragedies in your life, and when you look at them by themselves, they are painful. They are evil. They hurt. But in the wisdom, in the loving providence of God, there's a reason. They work together to make a symphony that brings glory to God. And God works ultimate good through it all. The number of our days and the moment of our death was determined before we took a single breath. I don't know about you, but that makes my head spin. In Matthew 6, 27, our Lord Jesus tells us that our worry and anxiety cannot add a single hour to our lifespan. In Psalm 90, Moses prayed, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. One of the things I take from that is we need to live the best we can while we have breath and realize that when our time comes, we will go home to a lo loving Father in heaven if we are trusting in Jesus Christ. That's the center that it all pivots on. Have you come to Jesus Christ? Have you believed that he is God who became man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay for the sin of every man, woman, and child who trust in him, and then was risen from the dead and is living forevermore, offering forgiveness and eternal life to all who put their faith in him? That's the pivot. That's the turning point in life, the pivot between heaven and hell. This psalm it's not just sugar and fluff. It offers much comfort through sound, meaty theology. It gives us a lofty, exalted view of God. He knows all. He's everywhere. He holds the days of your life in the palm of his hand. And he's known all the days of your life from before you were even born. Looking at verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Um, if it wasn't so wet, I would challenge you to go down to Dolphin Island or Orange Beach this afternoon and stop and try to count the sand there on the seashore. Uh, don't do it because it's going to be too wet. But you get the point. If we were to try that, that doesn't begin to give us an idea of how much God thinks of us. We stop and think, well, God is over the whole universe. How can he worry about me? I don't know the how, but I know that he does, because he's revealed that. He's that mighty. He's that powerful. His brain is that much beyond ours. He does keep us in his thoughts, and it's a wonderful thing to meditate on that. Then jumping down to the last verses of the psalm that weren't part of our reading, but they're powerful. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David just took so much time saying that God knows him inside and out and now he says, search me, O Lord. Well, what he's doing, I think, is surrendering to the truth he's written of. Lord, I know you know all things, so I might as well just open myself up like a book and say, search me, Lord. Look at my thoughts, look at my mind, look at my heart, look at my motives. Look at my past. 
I can't hide it from you. Search me, look at me, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Examine me. See if there's anything in me that's grievous. And the Hebrew word for grievous there means painful. If there's any way in me that causes me or others or you, Lord, pain, lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, let me know it in a healthy way that with your help I can change those painful things. With your grace, I, I can live differently. If there's any way in me that causes pain, Lord, change me, heal me, lead me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.